one of the things we really uh, find most satisfying about these annual symposia is that our own faculty uh, participate. And for this morning session, we have two, uh, Frank Barney and David Meyer, both from the uh, social sciences, social studies department. Um, and we're going to start with Frank Barney. And he's going to go to the podium and speak briefly. But his, his um, the subject this morning is TR's impact on international affairs. So Professor Frank Barney. as a world power and as a major player in international affairs, but that was not always the case. For much of the early history of the nation, Americans were content to look inward, and the presidents followed that lead. Americans were more concerned with domestic affairs, they were concerned with the expansion of American boundaries over the continent. In the, uh, our speaker's presentation this morning, she mentioned the concept of the city on the hill. Many of my students who I see here today are used to me talking about that. It's, again, the concept that this nation was something different. And out of that, I believe, came the concept of manifest destiny, that the United States was destined to expand over the entire North American continent. And later, I think the concept of American ex uh, exceptionalism, that there, again, there was something different and unique about this nation. But Americans, for about 100 years, tried very hard to avoid getting involved in anybody else's business. George Washington warned the nation against entangling itself in alliances with other countries. John Adams attempted to keep the nation out of the wars that were sweeping Europe. Thomas Jefferson went so far as to largely dismantle the nation's military establishment on the grounds that if we had no military, we would be less tempted to intervene in foreign conflicts. Although, in fact, that led to the perception of weakness of the United States, which really caused our first overseas military venture against the Barbary Pirates. James Madison and James Monroe followed the tradition as best they could and attempted to remain aloof from the conflicts of Europe, although they did wind up getting involved in the War of 1812. But the country refused to involve itself beyond its own boundaries and immediate environs. The Monroe Doctrine, which appears to be an attempt to flex American muscle in the international arena it has to be understood in the light that there was no American muscle to flex at this time. We were not a world power. We were not a second-rate power. The doctrine was really an attempt to create a hemisphere in which foreign powers would not trade, leaving the U.S. free from foreign conflict. Of the presidents who followed, right up until McKinley, <clears throat> only a handful had any meaningful attempt to involve a nation in foreign affairs or had a coherent, aggressive foreign policy. Very quickly, just to run through the names, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, Zachary, uh, James, James Tyler, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan. We went through all those presidents, and all of them were far more concerned with domestic affairs. Only James K. Polk, among the first 15, have a real foreign policy, and it was concerned primarily with adding land by forcing war on a reluctant Mexico. He was not concerned, heavily concerned at least, with overseas involvement in the affairs of foreign nations. Abraham Lincoln, of course, faced a domestic crisis of cataclysmic proportions, which limited his foreign policy to the succinct phrase, one war at a time, attempting to minimize potential issues with other nations. Andrew Johnson spent most of his single term simply trying to hold on to his office. Ulysses S. Grant's sole foreign policy was ensuring that France did not establish a strong foothold in Mexico. While Rutherford B. Hayes, James Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, Robert Cleveland, and Benjamin Harrison presided over a long period in which U.S. foreign policy was limited to expanding trade and establishing a foothold in the Pacific by acquiring the Hawaiian Islands. By the time William McKinley took office, Americans were accustomed to this inward focus. They were accustomed to the idea of avoiding entanglements abroad. They satisfied themselves with the drive to expand across the North American continent. Having spent more than a century turning their gazes ever westward toward the expansive frontier, they had never given a great deal of thought to what lay beyond their own nation, aside from a few tentative overtures in the direction of purchasing Caribbean islands from the colonial powers who had long since claimed them. 
although the Spanish-American War was fought on McKinley's watch, it was a war I don't think he ever really wanted, and that he tried strenuously to avoid, but it was a war Theodore Roosevelt desperately wanted. He was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, but he was really the de facto Secretary of the Navy. He pretty much ran things there. And he shouted long and loudly that it was a war the United States needed in order to prove itself to the rest of the world and to acquire an empire that would allow it to compete with the great powers. When McKinley hesitated, Roosevelt complained that the president had all the backbone of a chocolate eclair. But it would be a mistake and an injustice to view Theodore Roosevelt as a short-sighted, belligerent warmonger. When he found himself unexpectedly president, he simply threw himself into foreign affairs the same way he had always thrown himself into every field of endeavor, at first. He aggressively expanded the parameters of the Monroe Doctrine, as our speaker has so eloquently told us this morning, unilaterally, unilaterally giving the United States the right to intervene uh, in the affairs of sovereign nations in the Western Hemisphere. It would be easy to view this as arrogance, and to some degree it is. But TR's reasoning was that if other nations were going to put themselves in positions of debt to foreign powers and then rely on the United States to protect them from the consequences of their actions, then the U.S. had the right to see that those nations did not abuse the protection extended to them by the Monroe Doctrine. And so the Roosevelt Corollary was born. When he felt that a major obstacle standing between the U.S. and the achievement of great power status was the need for a canal connecting the oceans, in typical fashion, he determined to build one. Going all the way back to Zachary Taylor, presidents had talked on and off about acquiring the land and building a canal. He actually did it. I'm not going to go into all the details. Our speaker this morning has covered it much better than I ever could. But he got his canal. He did it, I don't want to say illegally, but probably extra-legally. <laughs> he was the first president to travel overseas and the first to send the United States fleet on a cruise around the world to show the flag and to demonstrate American naval might. But his most significant achievement in the field of foreign affairs may well have been the negotiation of the treaty that ended the Russo-Japanese War, a war that really didn't directly touch the United States at all. So again, this is markedly different than the concepts of other presidents who only dealt with foreign affairs insofar as they affected the United States. His style and negotiating, helping to negotiate this treaty, or brokering this treaty probably more, more accurately, was remarkably similar in some ways to how he dealt with domestic labor management strife. Get both sides to sit down together and not let them leave until they agree on something that would help both parties. It was not a treaty that directly served U.S. interests, but it was a treaty that probably needed to get done. We can see a change following the Roosevelt administration and the way American presidents looked at foreign affairs. Before Theodore Roosevelt, most presidents paid little or no attention to them except to try and stay out of involvement in other people's wars. Roosevelt, however, appear, appears to have viewed foreign affairs the same way he viewed domestic affairs, as something that needed to be addressed if the United States were to be the mighty nation he envisioned. He became president in a new century, a young president, the youngest, at that time, the president of a young nation in the young century, and he believed that this nation needed to grow into the century and into its role in world affairs. The men who followed him in the White House have, for the most part, followed his lead. No longer are presidents able to ignore the rest of the world and hope it leaves them alone. For better or worse, Theodore Roosevelt established a tradition of American presidents taking an active role as world leaders. Today, the President of the United States is generally referred to as the leader of the free world. I'm sure that's a phrase Theodore Roosevelt would have loved. By changing the way American presidents looked at foreign policy, he helped put his nation on the road to great power status. Thank you very much. those opening statements, you'll have a chance to engage with uh, Professor Barney here in, in a short time. Ever since we began these uh, symposia five years ago, I've been wanting to get David Meyer to talk about the, the Roosevelt and, and the Russian pogroms. This was a period of intense anti-Semitism in some parts of Europe 
Russia, and Roosevelt was aware of this. People petitioned him to get involved with this. He was uh, very cautious about it. But David Myers, not only the, uh, the chair of the Department of Social Sciences here, but he is, has an intense interest in Holocaust studies. Um, and uh, I think this is going to be just outstanding. So David, please, uh, Roosevelt and the Russian program. <laughs> by starting the presentation by falling over your own feet. <laughs> when one addresses the, the, the question of, of Roosevelt and the Russian pogroms and trying to place them in a context of making sense of Roosevelt's actions, you'll find that as you approach April 6th of 1903 and you're looking at the letters and the exchanges that are taking place, what's very clear, and I'm starting with this focal point and we're going to broaden it out, but when you focus in on, on Roosevelt's attempt to understand the events that are taking place in Kishinev, in particular, the Pogrom, the territory that would be known as Bessarabia, a territory uh, that was only part of the Russian Empire uh, as of 1812, uh, and I'll go back to Bessarabia and Kishinev in terms of the details in uh, just a second. But the idea of looking at Roosevelt's response, just as a reminder, even before I begin the details, What's clear is that Roosevelt is torn, and I would say, in the best sense, as a human being. Because as he's confronted with the information that took place over the coming months, it's not fair to say that he was simply responding to the plays and the public call and the petition with 12,000 somewhat signatures on it, asking him to take a stand. The fact is, is that he was torn because while he felt for the individuals who were killed uh, in those pogroms, I think honestly. He also realized that there were serious limitations on how far he could go, and he was not certain how far he could go in pressuring, pressuring the Russian government. And the argument would be very simple. Uh, if one boiled it down to, can the United States intervene in what were considered to be domestic Russian affairs? I would add, perhaps, now, you got that, I'm going to go back to it, to get a better feel for what happens in Kishinev, beginning on Easter Sunday, April 6th, 1903. But I want to step back just for a moment to remind you of what these terms mean and how they are anything but easy to grapple with today and they weren't easy to grapple with in the days of Roosevelt, which would have made any decision he could make more complicated. Russian pogroms, what do they represent? As Clay indicated, anti-Semitism was a part of life in the Russian Empire. Jews were restricted to a territory known as the Pale of Settlement, running roughly from St. Petersburg through modern-day Ukraine. They were restricted further to the towns that they could live in. They were, uh, as you approach the end of the 19th century, subject to twice the normal enlistment in the Russian army, which uh, interestingly enough, was 25 years. Uh, and so Jews were not uncommonly, when they were drafted, forced to serve for 50 years. So the situation for the Jews was uh, less than enviable. At the same time, we have what are considered to be the outbreak of popular violence against the Jews, and thus the term pogrom. But the problem becomes how we understand uh, just what we're talking about. Is it a popular outbreak of violence against the Jews of the community. Was it, on the other hand, perhaps led and inspired by members of the Russian Orthodox clergy? And before one gets too drawn up even into that, we need to remember that the Russian Orthodox Church was part of the Russian government at the time, and was part of what I would call a Russification campaign, as well as the extension of the Orthodox traditions to as many corners as they could. I'm not suggesting, however, that they were in some conspiratorial sense, uh, manipulating the events towards pogroms. But now, in terms of pogroms, to give you a, a sense of the immediate environment, when Alexander II was assassinated in 1881, again, this is sort of the conflicting messages that you're going to get, Alexander II was on his way to propose the creation of essentially a, I'll be generous, more democratic structure for the Russian state. He had but 20 years earlier, issued his Edict of Emancipation, 
Uh, despite the conflicts, the image was one of promise for Russia's, pe Russia's peasants and for Russia's future overall. But he's assassinated at that moment when it appears that he's going to go the next step towards modernizing his government. His assassination by a group known as People's Will had a spin-off effect in many villages in the form of pogroms. We don't know how many of them were official, how many of them were spontaneous. We just simply know that it became a problem after the assassination. We know that throughout the 1880s, there were pogroms uh, in Russia. We also know, however, that after the death of Alexander II, his replacement, Alexander III, was a very uh, aggressive and effective administrator. He was also the instigator of the O'Connor, the Russian secret police. So, what else can we add to the picture? The image of the Jews in terms of the Russian government would include that of being involved in not simply underground movements like People's Will, but also other groups that were desiring to overthrow the Russian government, those that would associate with the uh, Russian Social Democrats and the Russian Marxists. Now we all get on like to Kishinev. At the same time that we're talking about 1903, the Russian government is now confronted, instead of just programs, think of it as political instability. By the time we get to 1903, the Russian government is confronting uh, hundreds, and some people estimate maybe in, 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 in a thousand plus so, terrorist acts within its borders every year. It's a serious challenge. The Russian government is looking for a way out, as you know, on the horizon, of course, is the Russo-Japanese War. What will ultimately transpire, of course, is we will have our uh, figure, Theodore Roosevelt, intervening, going through the 1905-1906 so. Why do I mention that right now? Because as you begin to look back and ask the question, what is Theodore Roosevelt doing while well, he's interested in the Panama Canal? He's interested in the extension of American influence over the Western Hemisphere. He's also going to be looking back on what was transpiring in Europe over the course of the 1880s and 1890s, and that was essentially what was known as the scramble for Africa. So as the, as the African continent was being absorbed formally into European structure, there's a certain irony that over in the Western Hemisphere you have precisely the same thing transpiring, even if it's delayed by a decade or so. So where are the priorities? Where is one actually looking? What does the president, who is looking at the possible re-election following the year 1904, do when the information about April 6th, 7th, and 8th begins to unfold and the public within New York begins to agitate for action? Let's remember that roughly 13,000 Russian Jews every year were coming to the United States, and they were coming, in particular, to New York. And they were, in particular, passing around first-hand information about what actually transpired in Kishinev. And now, of course, here are the details. There were at least, of the 50,000 Jews that lived in the town of well, roughly 100,000, hundreds of them uh, were uh, injured. You can guess that in, in thousands, at least 50 were killed. We know that their shops were looted. And we also know uh, that ultimately speaking, this will become a catalyst for the Zionist movement. We could even say one of the linchpins ultimately uh, behind the momentum that would go towards the creating of the state of Israel in many years yet to come. So what's Roosevelt's scenario? April of 1903, April, May, June, can the United States ultimately do anything? Should the United States intervene in the domestic affairs of Russia? Roosevelt at one point actually contemplated making a donation to an organization that was gathering funds for the benefit of the survivors, to do something for them. It wasn't a big donation, it was a symbolic donation. But in the final analysis, his advisors told him that it probably wasn't the wise thing to do. He would have fixed his signature to the petition of 12,000 names that would be ultimately sent to St. Petersburg and summarily rejected. But he recognized that there were limits to what he could do. But at the same time, I think on a personal note, we can say that he also recognized the pain and suffering of a relatively small group of people in a relatively backward part, uh, relatively uh, backward part uh, of the Russian Empire. So what happens afterwards? Is there a way to assess this event as you move from 1903 onwards? Well, the sad future is, of course, the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. The sad future is, however, that in 1905, Russia will begin uh, confronted with internal revolution and change, and they will again be confronted with pogroms. And they will again brutally suppress them. So, again, one has to ask the question, uh, was this, from Roosevelt's point of view, a battle worth fighting? Or was the greater battle to be seen in America's role as a mediator, as a power to be trusted? How to balance out these two very demanding 
pieces of world history as they unfolded at that moment. I think the closer you look at it, the more you have uh, again, several angles, one of which is Roosevelt, politician in New York, the other which is Roosevelt, politician as president, the fact that he does have a policy that is directed towards the Western Hemisphere, and I think you could argue that he doesn't want to open up the door, as you've heard many times so far, to the possibility that those same individuals in Europe will think that as he's over there, they should play some role over here. So Kishinev is a good example. Roosevelt, I think at his best, but also probably at one of his more complicated points. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think some of our students are now having to leave. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Garnett, Professor Meyer, and Julie Green from our keynote. This is really a chance. Uh, every year we do evaluations, and people always say the same thing. There wasn't enough time for audience questions. Not enough time for the audience to participate. We just jam so many things in. So we've got a goodly time here, up to 45 minutes. I just want to start with one quick question for David. For those who, who need a more precise definition, what is the full drop? How do, what, what exactly are you talking about here? I stay sitting, I trip over by a feet either. Good. Um, you know, the, the concept of Rome is specifically linked with Eastern Europe. And it is a, a term that is typically uh, employed for 19th century, uh, what the newspapers would look at, it appears to be a popular uprising against the Jews of the community. And like any, any good term, um, it, it seems to be laced uh, with uh, elements of, of analysis and, and perhaps elements of wishful thinking. Uh, the problem with the term pogrom is that we, we can't definitively say that it was just spontaneous. And Roosevelt himself would have been confronted with the fact that the popular image coming from the uh, survivors and that, you know, those that were immigrating was that the Russian government was actively encouraging pogroms through its various agencies. Uh, although, typically, it's going to be the, uh, the priests of the Orthodox Church that are going to get a good deal of blame. So. so it's some sort of a spontaneous, maybe, organized persecution with violence against the Jewish community. There's certainly an opportunistic character to it, and there is there's a spontaneous, but they tend to come at uh, interesting times, like Easter. <laughs> and you were saying approximately 50 people were killed, thousands or hundreds injured. Well, in the case, in the case of Kishinev, I mean, when you get right down to it, the numbers are relatively small. Uh, the, the catch is that it has much more of an international resonance. Uh, it goes into the newspapers, the, the, the fact that he's made an effort to discredit the Russian government as being antiquated. Um, uh, the fact that at this point in time, compared to previous events, it appears that there are more newspaper accounts circulating than had ever been the case before. So it's an event that is not, in and of itself, significantly different from other pogroms. It's different in terms of the internationalization of the event. We have any other, we have a question here. Please speak up. I'll repeat the questions just so that they're on tape. Go ahead. I have a question for Professor Barney, and then depending upon your answer, sir, I have a follow-up. Okay. Um, the question is, did the United States have any choice but to become a great power? I mean, was the alternative that we would be like Africa or China, carved up inevitably into spheres of influence by these so-called great powers if we didn't ourselves become a great power? Did we have any choice? You, know, you talk about the long isolationist uh, tradition of America, but he's suggesting maybe we have no choice but to rise to world power. I think that's, that's an excellent question. I tend to think that probably it was inevitable. Uh, the alternative would have been to remain a second class power, or a third class power, which we've been for most of our existence. Given the spirit of the American people, I think that was unlikely, first of all. And given the spirit of with the leaders whom they chose, sooner or later we were going to move into the international arena more, arena more aggressively. But yes, I think it, given the size and the resources of the, the continent, if we didn't exploit the resources, someone else would, and if we didn't have the power to prevent that, it probably, it might very well have happened. The greatest crisis, of course, uh, in that regard, was the American Civil War, which is actually my field. Uh, the 
the fact that the United States came so close to splintering itself. And once you establish the precedent that states can break off from the Union, then where does it stop? You know, it, it, was, it could have been just the North and the South, but it could also have led to dozens of republics scattered across the United States, across the North American continent, in which case I think we would have been fragmented, weak, and ultimately segmented and exploited by the rest of the world, by the European powers at least. You reserve the right to follow-up. My follow-up follow then is, uh, given that it's inevitable, don't you think it's a wonderful thing that Theodore Roosevelt happened to be the man at the helm when it happened? If, it, if this was inevitable, isn't it appropriate that Roosevelt was there at the moment? Yeah, I do. Um, I got myself in trouble as an undergraduate once uh, in, in the 70s. And remember, it was the 70s, so those of you who are old enough to remember, think of the spirit on the campuses in those days. Uh, when I said in a class on American imperialism, which was taught by a communist professor, I said, when did empire become a dirty word? And his response, of course, was to give me this horrible glare. And other students in the class, many of whom were there because it was better than Vietnam, and it was better than Vietnam, were mortally offended by our response. But again, if I'm constantly, my students, and I see a lot of you here, you're probably sick of hearing this, I believe history needs to be studied in the context of the era in which it was made. And for us in the 1970s or today in the 21st century, to judge the events of the past by our own moral compass does the people who live in the past a great disservice. And it also prevents us from understanding history. So yes, I think it was a good thing that the United States became a great power. I think it would be hard to argue that the presence of the United States as a great power, or at least potentially great power, in the 1940s, when World War II took place. Without that, I don't know where the world would be today. I know it's politically incorrect to uh, speak of the Soviet Union as, as the enemy, but they were viewed as the enemy throughout the Cold War. And Americans rightly or wrongly believe that we were what prevented the world. We, were, we stood between the world and the domination of a totalitarian power. Again, had the United States not been a world power, I don't know how that would have played out. So I, I think it is a good thing. I think Theodore Roosevelt was the man for the moment. Uh, before he came to North Dakota, again, Theodore Roosevelt was not my specific field of study. It's the American Civil War. I knew something about him, but mostly what I knew about him was almost a cartoon. But, uh, the shining glasses, a uh, bushy mustache, a big smile, and uh, a bombastic, headstrong politician. When I came here and began to study him more closely and understood his high, high degree of intelligence, I was much more impressed with the man and the president. Again, it's, it's hard to justify some of the actions he took, but in the context of the era in which he took them, I think it's not hard to understand them. Julie, uh, this is a good time to bring you back into the question, and, and I was thinking of asking you this during your talk. Of course, we were out a little late, but it's sort of the question of the great man theory of history. I mean, in your book, you you attempted to sort of write it without Roosevelt to the extent possible because your real focus was on the workers and the, the people who actually made the Panama Canal happen, and there were literally tens of thousands of them, and their stories are compelling. But you said before you went up that you sort of almost found yourself back with Roosevelt because it's a nice narrative tie and because of the thickness of, of what he exemplifies. So. Here's one question. If Roosevelt had never been born, would there be a Panama Canal? Uh, how much agency does he actually have in this great engineering event? Well, that is a great question. I think he possesses a lot of agency. I mean, I, I do, I have my qualms about Roosevelt, as you said. I, you know, I come to this subject as a labor and working class historian, and a lot of people like David McCullough have written uh, brilliantly about the Panama Canal. So, so my role as I was writing my book was to try to tell a different story, to tell it from the perspective of the working men and women who built it. And, and the last thing I wanted to talk about in my book was Theodore Roosevelt. Um, but I realized that, and my editors helped me realize that, um, <laughs> uh, that, that especially if I wanted to reach not just professors and students, but I really wanted, I mean, it is a great story, and I wanted to reach a larger uh, audience, and they said, well, how can you do that without talking about 
the individuals who exercised a lot of agency, like Roosevelt. So I ended up realizing that I, I needed to, to use him and use his agency in telling the story. Um, and the fact is that he, I mean, he was an amazing person. He, he had this ferocious appetite for power and for life and for, you know, changing the face of the earth. Um, and even though my talk today and, and my book are both kind of about trying to disrupt the triumphalism we associate with the canal, I also acknowledge that there are some darn good reasons uh, why it's a triumphalist moment. It was an incredible uh, canal bridging two oceans, uh, 60,000 people involved uh, over the years, almost 200,000 people involved. It, it was a, a monumental thing. And would it have happened without him? You know, another person might have come along, but it wouldn't, it certainly wouldn't have had quite the shape and drama that it had without him. Go ahead. You know, one of the themes that bridges the two uh, comments, uh, when one looks at American policy under Roosevelt, and you're looking at declarations uh, suggesting an extension of American authority over uh, South America. Uh, go to Buenos Aires, and they're going to do that with the, uh, maybe you just sort of a plain smile and say, uh, you've got to be kidding. Uh, the idea of, of extending American authority, uh, and, and let's ask ourselves blunt questions. There are no American military bases to be spoken of. There are no American military activities that go down uh, from the least back then uh, into South America. But, Panama Canal, you could say, is where the rubber hits the pavement. That's where the money speaks the loudest, because that suddenly represents a real expansion of the presence of the United States, and one that's permanent. So instead of, let's say, putting the declaration towards all of the Western Hemisphere up front, realize that the money only goes to the Panama Canal. Yes, please. things have to happen. 
and the moral vision, the moral righteousness is with the United States, and that led him to, by today's standards, some pretty uh, rough judgments. I mean, in Cuba, he, he was happy that the officials there resorted to public horse whipping of Cubans who violated sanitation rules. In the Philippines, he was very adamant that uh, he was privately upset about the atrocities, the water tortures, and things like that. But he was very, very ferocious in shutting down public criticism, in trying to cover over, in saying that anyone who's critical is basically not manly enough to do the job that has to be done. Um, so, you know, I think it is really important. I think Dr. Varney's point about the moral compass of today uh, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that the morality then for someone like Roosevelt was different, um, but also that the moral compass of the Filipinos was different too. They wanted independence. They thought the United States was going to war against Spain um, to help them achieve independence, and instead the United States became a new colonial power. And that was, that was very difficult in terms of their moral compass, but they had to find a way to deal with it. I think, you know, the, the whole issue of the U.S. as a world power is so fascinating because of this complication. You know, I had a, a colleague at the University of Maryland who, um, when I, they did a thing when my book came out, and, and because I talk about empire in the title of the book, he said, well, you, you act like you think empire is bad. And, um, and he said, don't you, don't you think that the U.S. built schools and did infrastructure? And I said, you know what? The history of empire would be really boring if it was only bad. <laughs> it's the fact that the good comes with the bad um, that makes it fascinating and troubling at the same time. And it is important to remember, as you mentioned earlier, that the universe is informed by the the racial prejudices of his time, that the people of the Philippines were simply not ready to govern themselves. They obviously believed that they were, uh, but he was firmly convinced in the righteousness of the kind of superiority of, of the Anglo-Saxon race, as, as he would have put it. So again, it's, it may seem unpalatable to our modern sensibilities, but by the spirit of his time, he's operating within pretty much normal parameters for, West, for Western power. But in, in his four-volume magnum opus, The Winning of the West, which is a really interesting text to read in this context, you know, Roosevelt is, is talking about the winning of the Ohio Valley, essentially. He, he was planning to project the book all the way out to Wounded Knee and beyond, but he didn't get around to it because he got so busy with other things. But he did write four volumes, and this is regarded as, in a sense, his most um, significant contribution to American history. And he says in it that a war against savages, by which he here means uh, stirred up American Indians, is the most righteous of all wars. And then he talks about the Boers in South Africa and the Anglo-Saxons. I mean, he, he does not mince words. He, he says that horrible atrocities have occurred on both sides. We have done things, we Anglo-Saxons have done things that are unconscionable, unacceptable, unjust, appalling. But when you look at it from the broadest perspective, these are righteous wars, necessary wars, and they're wars on behalf of the world that we want to bring about. And so he left a lot of clues in that text. It's hard to read those passages today. You can, you can hand them out to students and, and they're appalled by what they read. But, but Roosevelt is wrestling with the problem of the Europeanization of the North American continent and the Europeanization of the globe. And, and, and he seems to think that this sort of appalling Violence is, is just one element that can't be avoided in this sort of domination. To justify the means. Yeah. It's a really interesting text to take a look at. Other questions? Yes, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to address to the panel the question of just the American motivation for an empire. We look at the other European powers who are looking for natural resources. We assume they were motivated by economic development taking over the areas of the world and selling products there. What is our motivation? Is it Roosevelt's kind of very kind of desire for adventure? Exactly why are we colonizing at this time with our huge natural resources, our massive markets? It seems like what exactly is the purpose for an American colonial empire, if you could 
address that? We've been talking about Empire, but not really asking ourselves why we felt the urge to do it. Um, professor's asking us, what, what were the motivations that led us to seek an Empire? The reference that I made in passing to the scramble for Africa was intended to demonstrate what was taking place on a global scale. And it wouldn't simply relate to Africa. It's also taking place uh, in, in Asia. And it's very clear, at least for me, that Roosevelt is part of that European mindset. It's, it's, it's not simply the social Darwinism. It's the consequences of social Darwinism that states that continue to expand have demonstrated uh, their uh, virility. Now, maybe you can't expand uh, the way you would like. As a matter of fact, even the notion of saying, uh, in some sense, that South America belongs to us, uh, reeks with an unbelievable arrogance. Yet, within the spirit of the times, uh, if sitting right next to him, metaphorically, we have uh, a Frenchman uh, or somebody representing uh, Great Britain essentially saying the same thing about Africa, uh, in, 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 in the spirit of the times, I think it makes sense. So while we use the terms colonial, uh, I think it probably would be safer to talk in terms of of an attitude towards empire and imperialism that has the civilizing component woven into it alongside of a social Darwinistic component. Others, others? If you wanted to be, in, in the early 20th century and in the 19th century, if you wanted to be a great power, you needed an empire. You needed um, colonies whom you could dominate economically. You needed to be able and willing to expand. You had to be able to demonstrate military might. And Theodore Roosevelt wanted this nation to be a great power. I think a good portion of the reason is simply Americans had decided, or many Americans, obviously not all of them, that it was time for their nation to take a step out of the world stage. You'll see this with other nations as well. When when the Kaiser's Germany, when the Kaiser's Germany decided, determined that they were going to become a great power, they decided they wanted an empire, but they were late getting into the game. Well, so were we. Well, our should be. And the Spanish-American War gave us the empire that we lacked. I think it's, there's a lot of reasons. The social Darwinism aspect of it is certainly part of it. I think economic um, prosperity plays a role. We wanted overseas markets, and some of them, many of them, have been snapped up already by European powers. But a lot of it, I think, is simply the, great, the game of power. And in the context of that time, great powers had empires. The, the, the one caveat I would add, and you'll notice that in my explanation I said nothing about economics, and that's because with the exception of Great Britain, uh, where you could estimate that at its peak, 20% of its GNP is going to relate to relations with one of its colonies, the residual part of its trade is going to go first and foremost to the con, and secondly, uh, I would argue, or maybe third, and then I can look at it, to the United States. Uh, when you would take a look at any colonial power, including the United States, uh, again, other than that minor caveat of Great Britain, there is no economic advantage to empire. That's, right. that's, I mean, that's the bottom line. So to argue that they're doing it for economic reasons suggests that either they bought into a myth at the time that simply didn't hold up, or the, the, the force of, of having a futuristic vision, uh, whether it's you know, wrong or not, the idea that these represent the potential for resources, the potential for expansion. It doesn't become reality, but it does become a motive for expanding your control uh, into those territories. Sure. Yeah, I would add, I mean, I think what Dr. Barney said is, is uh, really a great statement of why Roosevelt wanted expansionism, basically, that he, he just thought we were ready, we were, a, you know, rising power, but to really be a great power, we needed an empire, we needed expansionism. But I do think it's important to keep in mind that the turmoil of the late 19th century um, and uh, there, there was a recession or a major depression in every decade in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. There was also a long 30-year uh, deflationary crisis. Prices kept dropping, putting businesses out of business, putting farmers under it. And so a lot of the turmoil, massive strikes, lots of populist unrest among farmers was, was due to those forces. And there was a mythic, as it was, I agree totally with, with the way you put it, um, but mythic as it was, there was a very strong belief that what we needed was markets abroad, that that would help us economically, it would solve the, the problem. Deflation was thought to be caused by overproduction, basically, so we needed more consumption 
and markets abroad would give us that. And there was also a sense that there was a sense that Americans, because of industrialization and proletarianization, that Americans were kind of losing their virility, um, that they needed to prove themselves as a manly race, and that empire would help achieve that. So all those kinds of arguments are sort of floating around in the late 19th century. And can I just pick it up from there for a moment? Because, I mean, it has, a, it has actually a North Dakota connection, I think. Uh, just before the, the Spanish-American War, Roosevelt gave a, a speech at the Naval War College, which was a very fire-breathing, imperialistic speech in which he said, all great nations have been warrior nations, and all great men have a little of the wolf in them. And President McKinley wasn't happy about that speech, and John, John D. Long wasn't happy about that speech, but Roosevelt was very happy about that speech because it expressed what he really thought. And he, he was, a, he was a, a student and friend of Frederick, Frederick Jackson Turner, and Turner's thesis was that American character had been, had been defined by the frontier, that Americans going over the frontier line and uh, plowing up ground that had never been plowed before and killing off the bears and varmints and having righteous wars against native peoples and building Masonic lodges and churches and schools, that that had been the crucible in which the American character had been born. And in 1890, Turner um, saw the census that effectively closed the American frontier and wrote his famous essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History. But Roosevelt had his own frontier thesis. It was more violent than Turner's. His view was that Turner was right that these pioneers on their Masonic lodges had, had been the crucible of American character, but he wanted to make sure we never forgot that there was violence at the center of this thing, too. Wars against Indian peoples, and that was the burden of the winning of the West. Well, he came to North Dakota in 1883 to get a little of that frontier experience because he regarded this as one of the last places where that kind of authentic Daniel Boone-like experience could be had. And he worried, as did Turner, as did all sorts of people, about what the closing of the frontier would mean for the way the American character was shaped. And so for Roosevelt to see that we could continue that pattern abroad in Cuba, in Hawaii, in the Philippines, in Puerto Rico, in other places, became a, an extension of, a, of something that he believed that, that if we lost, the American character would deteriorate. And so, the same thing that brought him to North Dakota in 1883 is, is at, alive in this, this imperialistic spirit. We were talking last night about Sarah Watts. Kristen Hoganson was here a few years ago. Both of them have looked about gender, virility, masculinity, and American character as one of the motivating forces for all of this. Go ahead, you were going to say. No, I think it's an excellent point, Clay. It's the idea of we need a frontier, that, the, that, the, that Americans needed a frontier, needed a place to prove their individual manhood and as a nation in a place to prove its national virility. And as my colleagues very accurately point out, uh, a lot of the uh, recent scholarship has really kind of exposed the myth of, of empire as an economic benefit to nations. A very fine historian, John Keegan, writing back in the 1980s, I think, uh, with, with the myth of uh, the price of admiralty was the name of the book. And it talked about how the, uh, many empires were simply not worth the trouble or the expense, and yet, it was almost as though you had to collect these colonies if you were going to be great. So it's sort of a, a national exercise of power. We have some other questions, I feel certain. Yes, back here. Before we get to the first one on the other, sorry. Comment, if you would, uh, relative to how Roosevelt's thoughts and feelings about imperialism and the necessity for war matured uh, as he grew through the presidency. Yeah, good question. How did Roosevelt's thoughts about imperialism and the necessity of war, etc., mature or evolve in the course of his career? Yeah, or did it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an interesting book called The Warrior and the Priest, uh, which, which argues that, interestingly enough, Wilson turns out to be the warrior and Roosevelt turns out to be the priest. That one of Roosevelt's uh, anxieties about his own presidency was that there wasn't a major world conflict for him to preside over and that therefore he could never be ranked as one of the very greatest presidents. But when he had opportunities during his presidency either to ratchet up or ratchet down, it turns out he ratcheted down the Russo-Japanese War and other affairs. Well, I think it would be fair to say that it, it's almost peculiar that when he's vice president, uh, he seems to be anxious to have these rather fire and brimstones type speeches regarding foreign policy. Once he's president, on the other hand, uh, 
you know, the, the theorist would say that he seems to be more inclined to look at areas of opportunity. We might call them political vacuums. We might call them areas where uh, he can assess the opponent quickly and say, there's really no serious danger here uh, to Americans, at least in terms of conceptually. And I say that because as we go down the hit list of the places that we find Roosevelt expanding, he's not confronting France. He's not confronting Great Britain. He's not confronting Russia. Uh, now, there's another piece that goes with that picture. Uh, not only is he not confronting the powers that exist at the time, he is also, in his actions, very conservative in his estimation that the relative strength of those other powers is going to remain static. That, that, I, I would say that's his, that's his wager, and that he's hoping that there's a window of opportunity for the United States to be included among the ranks of those powers, but not to come rushing to a conflict with them. It's also interesting that after his presidency, he becomes more aggressive again. And he's continually urging Woodrow Wilson to take a firmer stand against, against Germany. So it seems, it's an interesting point, which quite candidly I've never considered before. He's far more belligerent before he's president and after he's president than while he's president. That's a good sign, I think. <laughs> I think that is. <laughs> Give him power. But another interesting thing about him is that he does ship the United States for all of his bellicose posturing, he shifts the U.S. Uh, profoundly away from formal colonization and imperialism. Um, he, he, we, we have formal colony in the Philippines, Puerto Rico has only limited freedom, but in general he prefers sort of economic and cultural domination with limited military interventions when possible. And that becomes a distinctive U.S. approach to things, informal. Uh, expansionism or informal imperialism and only uh, limited episodes of formal colonialism. And in fact, he famously said of the Dominican crisis that he would, uh, rather than, um, than colonize the Dominican Republic or occupy it, he would rather swallow a porcupine backwards. Yes. <laughs> there was a second question. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, before you get to the of it and how it you know played out with the workers 
it was, uh, in that sense, in that sense, a pretty good deal. The, the workers' complaints, both Caribbeans and US workers, had more to do with, they felt like they didn't have much freedom in the canal zone. Uh, the government really ran things with a, an iron fist. Anyone who was not producing constructively to the project could and would be deported or imprisoned and assigned to prison labor. Um, there was no freedom of speech, things like that. So in that sense, the Constitution did not follow the flag uh, when it came to the canal zone. And, and workers' protests often focused on that fact. But Julie, one of those persistent stories about Roosevelt's visit in 1906 was that he um, declined some ceremonial events and actually wanted to go into the barracks where workers were to eat what they ate, to see how they were, that he would stop any worker that he saw and say, how are you doing? What do you need? Are you being treated fairly? Do you have any complaints? Is that true? Uh, well, Mary Chatfield, a stenographer who wrote a memoir and discussed his visit, said, ha, basically. She no. said, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's true or not myself, but she thought that it was all a sham. But she said if, if the public really thinks that he ate what those working class men ate, they're fooling themselves. She thought it was kind of a, a media trick. She was there. She was, yeah. And so she's debunking the instant myth that was yeah. created about this? Yes. And saying that, in fact, he did not do all those she, things. Yeah, she, her argument was that it was all orchestrated. And according to her, that was kind of what was said among the workforce there. But that, I mean, maybe maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But the, but the story that evolved and that David McCullough tells in such detail is of this man who who refused to go to the fabulous banquet because he wanted to go see the cabbage that, and the soup that the actual workers were ingesting. And you're, you're saying that there's reason to doubt this story. I'm saying that Roosevelt was brilliant at media manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just pointing out. We are very disappointed. <laughs> and we have some doubts. <laughs> knows they had as much interest, they were a greater world power, it was all built on their navy. Why didn't they? Uh, good question. We had, we had a treaty in the, the 19th century treaty with Great Britain that said that we couldn't do this alone, that it would have to be a joint effort and joint uh, sovereignty. And that, and yet, when Roosevelt became president, we concluded a second <coughs> treaty with Great Britain that gave us a green light, and Britain effectively subordinated itself to America's canal agenda. Why? Sue, so, uh, my answer. Looking over Egypt, get the British. Uh, anticipation of a shorter route uh, over into India. Uh, I don't think it represented the same kind of advantage as it did in previous discussions. And the British were going to be able to use the Panama Canal. We were quite happy to let the Americans pay for it. <laughs> okay, but, I mean, those are two good answers that the British had other options and that the British knew that they would be the beneficiaries of it. But I mean, is, isn't it also possible that Britain understood the rising power of the United States and? and what, there was some sort of a tacit acknowledgement of America's move in the world. I, I don't think you could have squeezed that uh, out of the bridge and not depended on it. Um, <laughs> the, the idea of suggesting that they're waning uh, is just an anthem to their sense of identity. Uh, I think instead, uh, I, I would call it a very paternalistic attitude toward the United States of saying, well, we'll pat them on the head, and as they begin to expand, uh, we'll use uh, our existing resources and our navy to uh, let's call it keep our other competitors in Europe out. Uh, while in reality, we know that the United States can't uh, do much more than give a kind of good press coverage to the event. This is, oh, sorry. Uh, um, uh, this is a slightly different point, but, but I will point out that the US, as it was constructing the canal, felt that all of Europe wanted it to fail. Um, and there were, they, they would go to Britain to negotiate, can, can we get your Jamaican workers to come, and, and the British government wouldn't allow it. That's one reason why they ended up relying so much on workers in Barbados. They tried importing Spaniards and Italians and Greeks, and they found those governments finally shut down uh, importation of workers from there. And, and I don't know what those governments were thinking, but the US officials believe that those European countries wanted to see the US fail. 
And in the case of Great Britain, their policy at this point was still that their navy would be larger than the next two navies of the world combined. And they had overseas ports that had bases in places like Singapore and Hong Kong and places like that. They simply, the canal law would have been helpful to them, was not a necessity, whereas it really was to American naval power. We have time for a few more. Go ahead. Yes. In your book, you mentioned the uh, background of the canal in reference to the French. We haven't talked about that. Was Roosevelt really keeping an eye on that French situation, do you think, or had it not come to his mind yet? Yeah, the question is about the French failure to build the, the Panama Canal and Roosevelt's consciousness of that. I think Roosevelt was very, uh, very aware of it. And in fact, the French the French effort being so disastrous, uh, you know, much higher mortality rates, they, they simply uh, were on the wrong side of history, if you will. The, the U.S. industrialization had matured, so the U.S. was able to build better steam shovels. Um, the, the, the reason for the cause of malaria and yellow fever had been discovered. The French didn't know that. They thought it was caused by bad air. Uh, plus the fact that the U.S. made the wise decision to build a lock rather than a sea level canal. All of those things made the U.S. effort successful, uh, whereas the French effort had, had failed and failed so, so infamously, so disastrously that the French government almost went bankrupt and the chief engineer and his son were both put on trial for corruption. So, so it was, it was Perfect, a perfect foil for Roosevelt because there you had France, old world nation, corrupt, lazy, messes everything up. Here's the U.S., the new world, smart, you know, ingenious, efficient, virile. Um, so I think that Roosevelt indeed was very well aware of the French effort and, and very much stood upon that to project the greatness of the U.S. The less upset done in Suez, which was a sea level canal, made the fatal mistake of thinking you could do a sea level canal through Panama. We thought so too until we got some time there. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Actually, it helped the main question not so well. Because uh, of uh, you brought one the um, uh, French um, uh, version of attempt to drive at Panama now. But um, uh, then uh, came uh, the um, uh, next um, uh, world well, Suez Canal. And uh, there's one uh, theory, I think, that um, comes in the comes in history book. Um, uh, it's mostly for um, uh, Dr. Green, but I'd like to hear um, uh, some expansion from the other two people on the panel as well. Well, um, uh, the Suez Canal um, uh, makes it um, uh, through, but um, as I said, um, uh, it's um, uh, very much a case of um, uh, empire and um, uh, making, uh, making uh, sure that um, uh, there would be a creation of Arab Frenchmen, not to mention uh, black Frenchmen, and so on and so on and so forth. And um, uh, some historians look at um, uh, Roosevelt and um, uh, he looks at um, uh, Suez, which is a great success, and he uh, says some um, uh, I can do it better, or the U.S. can do it better, and we will really be um, uh, leading um, uh, American, um, uh, American, South American um, uh, countries into a finer sense of their own Americanness. And so it's not a question so much of engineering, or at least as much as engineering, it's about the Americanization of Central and South America. It is indeed that. There was a lot of discussion that this was the first step towards Americanizing Central and South America. And, and the officials in charge of the U.S. Canal Project did uh, compare what they were doing to Suez, um, especially in terms of uh, celebrations. They, one of the great, to them, one of the great tragedies of the Canal Project by the U.S was that it could not be celebrated in the way it should have been. They, they were very aware of how the Suez Canal had been celebrated when it was finished, and they wanted very much to outdo that. They wanted a fleet of ships to go carrying President Wilson through the canal to California to the World's Fair. Um, but 
one of the one of the ironies of history is that the canal was completed just as World War One was breaking out, and so pretty much all plans for celebration had to be dropped. Instead, what what you had was a lot of comments in the U.S. Uh, comparing these two moments, um, saying things like, you know, in Europe they've been busy with death and guns, and in the U.S. we've been busy with the steam shuttle and producing a new world, and now you see the results. Cool. We have just a few more minutes. Go ahead. jump in here and say that um, I, I do think that uh, what I argued today was that Roosevelt not only expanded U.S. power, but intertwined our notions of the, the meaning of that power with a sense of moral righteousness. And that was not completely new to Roosevelt. That's a strain that goes back at least to Jefferson, who talked about it, uh, the U.S. as an empire of liberty and that we must expand this notion of liberty. Um, but I think that with the canal, that became such a brilliant statement of idealism and moral righteousness. And, uh, and I think myself that one of the fascinating and complicated things about American power in the 20th century is how Americans sometimes uh, fail to see the negative consequences of their actions in the world because they get focused kind of like Roosevelt did on the, the good side, the moral righteousness. When I look at the issue relating to Kishinev and trying to figure out how that fit into Roosevelt's vision of American foreign policy, the part I was impressed with was the extent to which it's not a problem that any other president uh, is going to avoid. Uh, the question of uh, when is it appropriate to uh, take a moral stand? Uh, is, is the cost of, of, of telling uh, a country that you would like to view as a friend that has some drawbacks um, to tell them how to deal with a, a problem they might have. And, and I think on a very human level, uh, to see the difference between trying to, to, to orchestrate a, a vision, uh, an optimistic vision, uh, visions are never realistic, the, the, the idea is this motivation, and yet at the same time to realize that, that despite the rhetoric, uh, Roosevelt at these international conferences, doesn't rush in as the advocate of, of liberty, justice for all, or a new constitution. He's there as a participant in the discussions. And I think that's the reason why he can mediate between Russia and Japan. He's not, he's not playing the big stick. He's playing the soft, but confident diplomat. Time for one more. Oh, go ahead. Make I have a question that's narrower than the questions we've been talking about regarding Panama. It, but it's the administration of empire. So one of the reasons that uh, Roosevelt so admired William Howard Taft was he had brought a kind of benign and paternalistic um, governorship to the Philippines. And then he became Secretary of War, and it was under that department's um, aegis that the canal project was administered. And there was one point at which Taft was sent by Roosevelt to, uh, for an investigative visit to the Canal. Was there, was, there, was there any consequence of that that resulted in bringing a more a greater paternalism to the problems of the canal? Yeah. Or was that just part of the cosmetics? That's the nine proconsular role of the world of the Panama Canal. Um, I don't know whether Roosevelt had any idea that the that the U.S. officials were really working hard at figuring out this issue of administration and especially the issue of does the Constitution follow the flag? Um, in other words, what rights do people in the Canal Zone or Puerto Rico or the Philippines have? And that they were looking 
uh, to a lot of different places to figure out the answer. I think um, a lot more research is needed to compare, say, what the U.S. did in the Philippines and Puerto Rico and Panama, um, because it's clear that there were lessons being drawn and circulating among officials in the different places. I want to thank uh, Julie Green, particularly for giving our morning keynote, David Meyer for talking about the Russian pogroms, Frank Barney for his uh, survey of American uh, imperial and isolationist history. I want to also say, I think poor Mr. Roosevelt's taken a few hits this morning, but um, <laughs> I'm sure you survived this. Um, Sherry Kilzer is the project manager for the Theodore Roosevelt Center. She's very much responsible for the success of all that we're doing here, and she is the principal organizer of these symposia. Thank you so much, Sherry. <laughs> Thank you.